Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful uh, for the way that you care for us. And um, we're thankful for this opportunity once again to study. Um, we ask for your Holy Spirit to teach us, to guide us, to direct our minds and direct us study as we look again at Ezekiel. And we know, Lord, that there are many things happening in this world, many things happening in our lives. And we just ask, Lord, that uh, we can trust in you, um, that you can help us as we go through these difficulties. Uh, be with us now, be with each person, each family, as we open your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> So good morning, everyone, and uh, I'm going to put my screen up as usual. Now, I was looking at um, a number of things. I was, I was going back over just to sort of complete uh, some of this information regarding uh, what we had studied in, in the measurement of the different parts of the temple and so forth, is, is I found um, an article. Now, the guy's a little bit odd, uh, um, but it was quite useful to read. And um, let's see if I can find it. I ended up saving it on my computer. And he has some good diagrams of the temple. Um, so actually, I'm going to bring this up first before we go to the verses. Um, it's called Finding Jesus in the Temple. So he, he's some kind of Christian, um, but he has some Jewish background, or at least he thinks he might. Um, so he has. Uh, all these different ideas. And, and he shows lots of different diagrams of, of the temple. Some are his own, some are just others. I guess he's an architect. And you can see here, this is uh, a drawing of the temple, the, the outer court and the inner court, the altar, uh, all the different gates and so forth. He has this interesting diagram here, which, uh, which is how I found this. I was looking at, uh, at images, Google images and found this one. And this led me to the article. And you can see here he has um, basically starting at, at 40 verse six over here on the right side. Uh, here, I'm just gonna get my hand so you can see. And, and it shows where he goes in and, and shows the direction of the different places that he goes to. And that's chapter 40, right? And then chapter 42, moves around, and then he comes out. And then you're gonna see chapter 43 is, is where he describes the altar and then Chapter 46, here he describes uh, the boiling places, or the kitchens, as he calls them. Um, so so the, this was helpful uh, for him. Now he has this one little question mark where he says he doesn't know how they got from 42.1 to 42.15, what path they took, because he just is on this side and then on that side. Um, so I'll send this to everyone, these articles. Um, he's a very good writer, um, but he's just a little bit, uh, you know, he's, he's not a normal person. He's probably got some kind of uh, Asperger's going on. Not great socially. It's not great with women, I guess. And um, so, so he has a lot of signs and his obsession with things. He has some uh, OCD and stuff like that. Uh, he had this thing where he had to turn the light on and off. 
and on again every time he came into a room. So he had some compulsions there. So probably a sign that he had Asperger's. Um, but sometimes people like that are really useful because they can look at things in different ways. Um, so his story is kind of interesting, his, his testimony of how he became a Christian. And uh, one of the things, this diagram here, where it shows, uh, it enters the temple with lay worshipers. This is the prince. And you can see the path that uh, the prince goes. And, and so, um, or the worshipers go when they enter and they go through this outer court this way. So, so some interesting diagrams. Um, he has all his footnotes and everything. It's quite scholarly, uh, lots of references. And then this is the part two one. So you, there's two articles of it. And uh, this again is gonna show uh, some of his ideas that he has about the gospel represented with this temple, which I don't necessarily agree with and how he looks at um, uh, the gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John how they're represented in Ezekiel's temple. And then he has this one, which we're going to look at. It's, it's a pretty good drawing of the division of the land uh, when we get there. So, so some useful things, uh, resources for everyone to have. Um, so, and boiling pot, priest portion in Leviticus 8, 31 to 35, seven days of consecration. Yeah, so we're going to run into that seven days um, showing up again and again. Um, okay, so looking at this, um, this last little bit of Ezekiel 46 again. Uh, one of the things that we had noted was this chiastic structure in 46. Um, uh, for, uh, 21 and 22, it talks about these, uh, the corner of the court. And just to look at that, I know it's not great looking at Hebrew, and I need to make this larger. Um, but we can look at the numbers. So you see the numbers here, uh, 2691. That's the word that means uh, a court. And then 4740, that's the word that means a corner. And so it's going um, to, he's going to be taken to, uh, to see um, this uh, court. And, and then when he, he sees it, there's going to be, in the corner of the court, um, and it's going to mention this again, the corner of the court, um, the court, or, or the court, corner, quarter, and you see here is this mirror. So it's going to mention uh, the corner of the court, the court, the corner, and again of the court. So he just keeps mentioning this corner of the court. Um, and so and that was an interesting idea. Now, then when we look at the, that diagram um, of, well, I'm not going to go back to the diagram, but when we look at it, we see that each of the corners has these uh, courts in them. So there's four of them. And I was going to count the words. So that's court shows up. One, two. Shows up quite a bit here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times in these two verses, you get the word court. So, so I think that's significant, the number seven here. And we've seen that repeated in, um, in here, uh, in this section 45, 46. Number seven showing up seven days, uh, dealing with the, uh, the feasts, and it's a period of 21 days, which is a symbol of midnight, starting from the first day of the first month. So, so we just continually have all these uh, 
patterns. So let's go uh, to chapter 47. It, was there any questions about chapter 46? I'm just going to make a comment on the four corners that reminds me of Revelation 7, 1. The four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds. Right. And, and that and, and that reference is, I think, important. So one is we know the four corners refer to a worldwide message. And, and, and these winds, of course, are um, representing what? I shouldn't say, of course. What are the winds representing in, in Revelation 7 1? Grief. Uh, of what? Grief? No, strife. Well, strife. Strife? Okay. Yeah, so strife. And what kind of strife? Well, you could include various things. I think uh, wars normally are associated with strife. Yeah, okay. But specifically what? I mean, wars <laughs> exist. So what are these wars prophetically that are being held back? Well, we know they connected with Islam. Yeah, so it is connected with Islam. Now, Islam is, of course, the east wind. So why is there the four winds being held back? Wouldn't that be a world war? Okay. Okay, so how many powers are there at the end of the world? Or even historically? Well, if you're going to take the, the beast, the dragon, and the false Morning. prophet. Three. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the beast, the dragon, Morning, and the false prophet. Good morning, guys. Prophet. Good morning, Mark. Um, yes. Don't I uh, know this? I watch on Facebook. Other guy is speaking about one big mammoth war and different kinds of countries against each other. God see that. He did get his angels get ready right on the horses and bring a gold chain down. As stuff that right now we don't know it is will be happening second time. Yeah, the Battle of Armageddon. Now, uh, as not see it, as start it, we don't know it will be happen. That guy speak on the Facebook. Yeah. He talk about facts that will be come. Move. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. So, so we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we have Islam. Now, can we put uh, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet as directions of the wind? As the four corners. So the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, and Islam. Can they represent the four corners of the earth? Okay, so if, if Islam is from the east, yeah. the dragon would be from the north. The, well, the dragon would be from the south. Okay, Egypt. from the south. Then your beast is from the north. Yeah, Babylon's from the north. And, and then, that would be yeah, false prophet from the west. Right, so the false prophet's from the west. And that, that fits. So those, so... Islam is being restrained, we know, but so are the other powers. So what's the role of Islam then in connection with the other powers? What is Islam, what is Islam in connection with what's going to happen? Think uh, grade 11 chemistry.
You're speaking the catalyst? It's the catalyst, yeah. <laughs> Islam becomes the catalyst for what's going to happen. So when the east wind is loosed, all the other winds are going to be loosed. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's the way I picture it. But all the winds are being held. And so that's a worldwide thing. Um, now, when it comes to these, um, the four corners then of the temple, what, what is it representing these kitchens with these boiling pots and the measurements that we looked at? What is it representing? Because we already have understood this, but just to kind of review. Well, those boiling pots, aren't they to prepare the sacrifice? Right. And we, we've looked at these sacrifices and so forth as messages, right? Right. So these are messages about the north, the south, the east, and the west, even though technically, you know, if you looked at the temple, uh, they wouldn't be uh, oriented that way. But is the temple itself isn't oriented, uh, you know, at an angle like that, but it would still represent that. So it would re represent the different directions. And, and so their messages dealing with the whole world, all of these different powers. And do we have a message about the King of the South and the King of the North? And um, do we have a message about uh, the false prophet? Do we have a message about Islam? Yeah, we have messages about all those things. And those messages are being prepared. That is the understanding of what's happening in the world. That's what this temple is about. And, and, and it's more complex than that, but that would be a simplification of it. Any, any comments on that? Okay, so I can pretty much agree with that, with that point, but you ask a, a further question before that. Okay. Um, Take a look at Ezekiel 46.22. Yeah, so 46.22. Um, in the four corners of the court, there were courts joined of 40 cubits long and 30 broad. These four corners were of one measure. Okay. Now, when I do the, when I take a look at the alternate reading. Yeah. The verse comes to say, in the four corners of the court, there were courts made with chimneys. Right. Three cubits long and 30 broad. These four cornered, not corners, cornered, were of one measure. Okay. So so what's that saying then in, in your thinking? Well, first off, we're dealing with this instead of the courts themselves being... 40 cubits long, it's saying the chimneys. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's right, though. I mean, I'm not maybe sure what they mean by chimneys, because maybe they mean something different than we would think. Well, that's that's why I'm looking at this. I mean, as, as you, you have that up there right now. Yeah. Made with chimneys. And then the corners is... Hebrew cornered and it's giving the, the reference, of course, to the verse that we're on. Yeah. So why would in, in this in the treasury of scripture knowledge, why would they then use the reference of the verse <laughs> as okay? You follow my my yeah, yeah I know. So they're doubling back on themselves. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um so the Hebrew word here for this made with chimneys, where else would we find that? Or know, which, which is the word that they're using? Made with chimneys, like which, which uh, word, which number? Well, how about uh, the H7000? Okay, the one joined. Okay. Right. So it, yeah, so it means enclose. Okay, and, and, and that's what a chimney is, is an enclosure of, you know, but 
Uh, yeah, it's yeah. Okay, so he. So where else is the word found? You're asking. Well, you just answered the question. There's only one place in the Bible it is found. Yeah, here in in this verse, Qatar. Um, now, just uh, to look at Brown Drivers Briggs, um, to shut in and close join. It says the meaning is dubious. That means they're not sure what it means. <laughs> so when I was when I was looking at this with the you know, basically the, the verbiage that's being used plus the alternate readings, I had to ask, I, I was asking myself questions because one way that this is being presented gives you a dimensional and the other gives you this made with chimneys and is the dimensional referring also to the chimneys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, though I don't think that, yeah, this is obviously the courtyard that's 40 cubits by 30. Okay. Um, so what it's, I, the way that I'm reading what you're reading is in, in the four corners of the court were courts and, and basically they're joined by chimneys of 40 cubits long and 30 broad. Um, that's kind of what it says, right? Um, yeah. But, but obviously the chimneys couldn't be that big. <coughs> Because that'd be as big as the court itself. So I think it's just it's um, more parenthetical when it says it's joined by chimneys. Um, but I'm I'm not sure what that means. That's pretty obscure um, way to interpret that. Now it says here in uh, Young's it says in the four corners of the court are perfume courts, forty long and thirty broad, one measure of the four corners. So they they use it as perfume, uh, which is quite a bit different than chimney. Right. Um, and then uh, it just says courts enclosed in uh, the Jewish Publication Society. Um, I, and, and when you look at the word Qatar, it actually is connected. Well, it's exactly the same as of the word that's translated as sacrifice, but I guess they know it's not the word sacrifice, but it does also mean incense. And incense. so it's about, it's about the smoke. So here's where they get the chimney. It's about the smoke of the sacrifices and the incense. And I think that's where they're getting the word chimney from. Okay, but what, what you're also pulling up here with the, the tertiary reference, you've got incense altar right so isn't that giving a you know a, a possible example from the holy place yeah i think i think that's what this this is uh, well it's just that you have a boiling place and you have to have chimneys and so there's chimneys there um so when young's translates it as incense and um the translators give an alternate reading of chimneys, um, and it just means joined or enclosed. Um, you know, I think the idea here is that it, this is kind of, uh, they're all joined together so that they have a, some kind of venting system for the smoke from the fires. Um, I think that's what that would uh, say. But in the four corners of the court, there were courts enclosed, as it says there, as in Young, he says again, um, referring to this perfume courts, and then and then the alternate reading of chimneys joined by chimneys. So I think that just gives us uh, some indication regarding how this is structured to deal with the smoke. All right. Right. The venting so, system. Okay, but that's that's literal. What does it mean figuratively? Right. So, so what would that refer figuratively? Well, go, go they, on because I know what it means, but yeah. All right. I, I was just going to make a recommendation. You take a look at the chat because Angela's had a couple of good comments. Okay. So, 
Uh, chimneys are conduits where heat and smoke rise out. Tubes of oil in Zechariah 4.12, where oil flows down into vessels. And, and, and we also know that the, uh, the prayers of the saints go up with the incense. Right? So, so this is referring to messages um, to God or prayers to God. So then how would we apply this in the context of what we're talking about with these prophecies? God fills us with his spirit, with his word, and then we share it. So yeah. we're both vessels receiving and chimneys pouring out. Right. So, so, and we're connected with God in this, in this instance, and this is the purification. So this, these offerings being boiled is a purification of them. And this has to do with the purification of the message. And it's because of the connection with God that that can occur. And also it's noted that, um, that this boiling, that the priests do this in um, uh, here, because this is for um, the laity, this, this, um, these boiling places here. But the priest boiled flesh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. That's Leviticus 8.31, and ate it with bread. And so we can see that this is also occurring. So this is about a message being given, but it's a message given to the world, not just a message for the priests. But the priests first have to have a message to themselves before they can give a message to others. And we can see that this message is, is based upon these measurements, now, um, and then Stephen had the measurement of that, uh, which was 40 by 30. Um, Stephen, do you remember the number you gave? It was like 50 yeah, feet and a half that, feet or something? That translates to 70 feet by uh, 52.5. Okay, so 70 feet by 52.5, right? And and so we have 70, what's 70 represent? Well, we, we can connect it to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Yeah. Or to the, to, to the um, Ezra was 70 days, you know, you have 120 to the first day of the first month, and then you have 70 days in mm -hmm. to the 10th day of the seventh month. So like close to probation, and then you have the 70 weeks of Daniel. Yeah. And then the 5, 2.5, so that's 5.25, and that represents. Yeah, it comes up quite a bit, a few times. It's um, the reverse of a, a 2.52. Two. Right. And um, you know it's from July 18 to December 25. Right. Yeah, so, so we have all these symbols. So that's, that's part of the message that's being given to the world. And in connection with these four corners, which are the four corners of the earth. Right. So, so this all fits together with this message in understanding what this message is. Okay. And so let's go then to chapter 47. And these were important to understand what's happening here. Um, so it says, and he causeth me to turn back unto the opening of the house. Now I'm looking at Young's. I need to look at King James. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Okay. So where this, is this water coming from? It's coming un, from under the threshold of the house. Okay. But and the threshold of the house is how many inches across? Anybody remember? Is 
Isn't it 252? Yeah, 252 inches. Okay. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east. Now it says the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. So what, what is that telling us? Where is this water going, coming from, and where is it going? So it's coming from the threshold right? and it's going to go east, but it's coming from the right side and, and the right side is, um, I'm just trying to see where, where they're getting, okay, there it is. So that's the right hand. of the house at the south side of the altar. So they're gonna use a different word. So they're using two different words uh, because right side can mean, um, uh, and that's, and do people recognize that word? Yamani, do you know where? Benjamin, son of the right hand. Yes. So, right. Um, and then the other word for south here is Negev. So that's the, the south, south of Palestine. So it usually refers to anything facing that direction. But isn't that also desert? Yeah, it, it means desert, literally. But parched is what the word means. So, um, but they use that word for things that are towards that direction, towards where it's dry. Now, uh, so we can see that we have this right side. Now, what does this remind us of, the right side? Or what should it remind us of? Or can you tell me what cherubim. it reminds What's that? It reminds me of, of the cherubims again. Okay. The right and the left. So there's the cherubim. I, I also think of the spear that punctured Christ. So I don't know if it's necessarily the right side. I think I always see it on the right side. You put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Okay. I always see the spear pierced on the left side because that's where his heart is. Yeah, okay. So maybe it is on that side. Well, uh, I mean, it, it was a right-handed thrust. Yeah, okay. And then Heidi says, you know, the right and left side, the sheep and the goats. Um, so anyway, we see this water coming from the right side and it's gonna go then on the south side. And so when the right side is the south side, right? Right. Yes. Yes, okay. That's correct. Yeah, correct. <laughs> um, so, so it's gonna come from that side of the threshold. It's gonna come from under the threshold, go out, not, straight down you know the stairs or anything it's going to come around the side on the right side and then it's going to go flow past the altar on the south side which is still the right side okay so that's that's the direction that this water flows um depends on what way you're looking at it well you would be looking east Right, okay, yes. Because that's that's the way that it's described. And the south side would end up being east. Uh, if you're looking east, it's on your right side. And then he brought me out of the way of the gate northward. So he's going to go out the north gate and led me about the way without the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward. So what direction is he going to be traveling? So he's he sees this, this river coming from this, from under the threshold, going past the altar. And then he's going to go out of the north gate himself. And then where is he going to be going when he's, he's going to go into the outer courtyard. And then he's going to go to the outer gate, by the way, of the looking eastward. So, so what is he, where has he traveled? 
And, and why is he going out this gate? And he says, there ran out waters on the right side. So what is he seeing? Can somebody describe this in their own words? Well, if he, if he is going out the north gate from the east gate, then the east gate's got to be to his right. Okay, so so he's he's by the the threshold of the temple, and he's going to go out of the east gate and that east or the north gate. That north gate is the north gate for the inner courtyard, right? Right. And then he's going to walk around. And he's going to go to the utter gate or that east gate that goes, is that where he's going? The utter gate by the way that looketh eastward? Or is he going to, to look at the gate that goes to the outer court from the inner court that looks eastward? Which, which gate is he going to? Well, he'd have to be going toward that east gate because he very rarely do we ever address anything with the west gate. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's no west gate um, at all. So there's there's so um, here. I'm going to go to this drawing so that we can look at that because uh, that will help us. Um, so I'm just going to switch screens here. Uh, switch shares. Okay, <clears throat> so what we have is we have, um, just gonna move along. I think there's, okay. So we have here, this is the drawing of the temple. And so this water is gonna come out from under the threshold and it's gonna flow on the south side of the altar. Now. Why is he not going to go through this gate? He, he doesn't, so he's watching this water and he's going to go through the north gate and come around. Why doesn't he go through this gate? Is it because of the water? Okay. Um, because of the flow of the water? No. So this, this is the gate that's only for the prince. Right? Then? So, so when he sees this water flowing out, it's obviously going to throw, flow out on this side of this gate, but he has to go to the north gate and come around to see it flowing out. He's going clockwise. Well, yeah, he's going clockwise. Starting at 12 at midnight, so to speak. I don't know if I, I mean, can he, go there. Once he but, leaves yeah. that north gate. But the point is, he has to go up the north gate. Well, I mean, he could have gone out the south gate and come around, but that's not. And the then direction. he would be counterclockwise. Now, now it says here the east gate is closed permanently after entry of God's glory. So this is, this east gate here is the one that's closed permanently. Um, at least <laughs> that's my understanding. Now this gate, the priest can come in through this gate. Or not the priest, the prince. But no one else can come through this east gate. So I think both of these gates should be closed, in my understanding. But uh, but but he's going to come around this way anyway. He's going to go through the north and come around to see this. This water is flowing out, right? That's what he needs to see. That this that this water is flowing out. So obviously he couldn't see it from here. You can see the water's going along the gate because it's going past the altar. But he has to go around the north gate then to see that. And I'm not sure what that means that he has to do that in, in a symbolic sense. Uh, but that's just physically how he has to do it. If he's going to look at, at this. So when, when it says uh, in verse 2, Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, led me about the way without. So he's being led 
And and what would this mean that he's being led? That he has a guide. Right. So he has somebody leading in this way. So I would think there's significance in where he's being led that, that we could apply to what's happening to us. So he's going to be led out of the way of the gate northward. And he led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward. So he's still in the utter court. And he sees that the water is going to run, run out. But behold, there ran out waters on the right side. So the waters are going to go straight out from under the threshold, past the altar, obviously on the right side of that inner gate. And then it's going to continue to flow through on the right side of the utter gate, the outer gate. Okay, so... We'll talk about what this waters, these waters are, but when we look at this here, um, it says in verse 3, and when the man that had the line, so who is the man that had the line? In his, in his hand went forth eastward, and he measured a thousand cubits. So who is this man that had the line? When do we see this? I can... Uh... Verse 40, sorry, chapter 40. Yeah, so in chapter 40, you're going to have this man who had the line. And um, so if we look at 40, verse 3, it says, He brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. So we, we also had referenced this to Revelation 11, 1. And there was given me a reed unlike unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar and them that worship therein. And, and just a reference to this. So in Revelation 11, just dealing with this measurement, how do we understand the measurement in Revelation 11? What, what is the measurement that's going to be given? We should know this. Because he's going to measure this. What is it? Yeah, the Millerite Temple, 46 years. Okay, well, yeah, but it's also 1260 years. Right? And if you go to Revelation 11 and you reference it back to Daniel chapter 12, where again, there is measuring, in a sense, going on. We also have rivers. So these are all going to relate to each other. So we're going to look at Ezekiel 47, Daniel chapter 12, and Revelation 11. They're all related. Um, but in this case, there's this measuring of the temple that has gone on. But now we're going to measure the waters and, and try to understand what these waters are. So in, in Revelation 11, it deals with the 1260 years, the 42 months. Um, so, so those periods of time. In, in Ezekiel 47... So he's going to measure this water, um, and he measured a thousand cubits. So, and then he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. So, what has he measured? Where? What has he measured so far in verse three? He went forth eastward and measured a thousand cubits. Is that the utter court? Okay. Well, he's measuring the length of the river from the threshold. Okay. And he's measuring a thousand cubits. So he's measuring a direction of the water going east. So a thousand cubits. What, what does that mean? How would we take this thousand cubits? What is it representing? Well, you've got 21,000 inches, right? Okay, so 21,000 inches, yeah. So what is he measuring? Is that the river up to the threshold? 
Right. So he's measuring the water. So the river up to the threshold. Yeah. Somebody else have a comment? Okay. So he measures this. We'll come back to this. Yeah. Um, is the man with the line the same as the man with the ink horn in chapter nine? Anybody have an answer to that? I would think yes. Yeah, we, we, we would think, who is this man with the measuring rod? Christ. Christ. That's the way that I take it. I think that's the way we took it. And he's the same one with the, the ink horn. Because Ellen White tells us that. The one with the ink horn is Christ. Um, and, 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 and so what is this ink horn and what is this measuring line? Are they related to each other? The inkhorn places the mark upon the forehead, the line, would that not be measuring the character? Right. So this is measuring the temple or the character. Now, of course, it is also periods of time. So periods of time are given to prepare the character. And these are time prophecies. And as people follow these lines, their character is developed. I just... Um, yep. So this here, 21,000 feet. It's uh, 1,750 feet. 1,750 feet. So 20, 21,000 inches is 1,750 feet, you're saying? Yes. So number 175, the only place in the Bible you get it is connected with the death of Abraham. Um, yeah, so and you've mentioned that before because we've run into this measurement before. Yes, it comes up in a, in a lot of, it was the length of a cubit being 21 inches, it's um, 1.75 feet. Yeah. And it's uh, encountering it quite a bit. Um, yeah. And so this here, if this goes ahead, this here thing on Sunday, it's, yeah. it's, on, the, it's on the 17th and it's at 12 o'clock. So if you get uh, 17.5, you maybe even connect it to that event. Okay. Just a thought. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that seems like a little bit of a stretch, but um, yeah, so the 175 shows up and, and so we can see that that's how many feet it is. Um, and it's a thousand, so so let's go on. Now, when he, when he measures this water, we know that this water is water Right, that's what he's measuring. He's measuring this river. But what is this? What are these waters about? Why is this water coming out from under the threshold of the temple and going eastward? And, and why is he measuring it? Why is he deciding to measure this water? Okay, so we're going to look at how many times he measures it. What? Well, Ellen White, she connects this here river to healing. Um, to healing, yeah. Yeah, there's a, she, told, she mentions it in Acts of the Apostles. Okay. And um, she says, it's a wonderful, wonderful is the work which the Lord designs to accomplish through his church, that his name may be glorified. Mm -hmm. A picture of this work is given in Ezekiel's vision. Yeah. of the river of healing and uh, she mentions uh, she quotes 47 which not maybe these verses but from uh, verses 8 to 12 right she would quote she quotes these later verses mm -hmm. um and, and because says, it's saying that it's, it's going to talk about that so we're, we're going to get to that so this is about what was the first part she says again she says it's a, a river of healing but and, before that she says it's a wonderful work which the Lord designs to accomplish through his church. Right. So what is that? that? That's about a message that his church gives. Now we know that this is about healing, but she's not talking about, you know, healing, you know, physical things so much, right? That's not about like the health message. That's not what she's saying. 
because this is about the healing, because we know about the healing of the nations. This is about the restoration that's, that's going to happen. And this is a work that God does through his church. So, so we've looked at this temple. This temple is a message. And now we're going to have a river flowing out from under the threshold. And it's going to flow out eastward. And then they're going to measure it. So let's look at these measurements again. So he measures a thousand cubits. And then the waters, how deep? It says to the ankles. Yeah. But the alternate reading yeah. calls it waters of the ankles. Yes. So to know how deep that is, how deep would that be? I'd say about three, three inches, maybe. Okay, you'd say three inches? I don't know. Maybe. I think maybe one more, maybe. Yeah, it depends where somebody defines four. the ankle. I mean, yeah, I mean, I would say my ankle is about um, five inches from the ground to my ankle bone. But I would say it's six inches. That's that's the way I would look at how deep the water is. Okay, so could be wrong there. Um, anybody else on how how deep this is? I would just continue to go with six inches. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and that seems what it, it would be. Um, now, you know, different people have different views. Some would say, you know, it's just to the soles of the feet, which wouldn't make any sense to me at all. Um, I would say it's about six inches. So then he's going to measure again another thousand cubits. So he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. Now, what does it mean he brought him through the waters? Um, he's walking through the waters. He's right. So he's following along uh, with with the angel, with, with Christ, I would assume here. And now the waters are to the knees. So how how long would that be? The waters to the knees. Well, I'm pretty short, so my knees might be two plus feet from the ground. Really? I don't, I don't know. How tall are you? <laughs> Anybody else on how deep that water is when it's, it's measured to the knees? Maybe about, How about a cubit in a span. Huh? A cubit in a span? Right. So you're saying what, 24 inches? Which is two I'm feet? Sorry. I'm sorry, the cubit and the span that we've been using, which would be 21 inches. 21 inches. Okay. Yeah. It's a cubit and a hand breadth. You'd say a cubit and a hand breadth, you mean? Is 21 inches. Yeah. Not a span, because that would be, that would, a cubit and a span would be 24 inches. Two feet. Yeah, I, you know, I should measure because I got a measuring rod here. A span's normally nine inches. Nine inches? Yeah, so um, it would be. Okay, that's nine inches, so that's even bigger. I misspoke. I was looking at this because when I did my measurement, I was looking at 21 inches. 21 inches is how far my knee is from the ground. And yeah, my ankle is six and it's 21 inches to my knee. Of course, you know, I'm six feet tall, so. Um, okay. 
So, so that's how, so we now have, basically it's a thousand cubits of that he, or 2000 cubits that he's measured. And he's now at 21 inches, which is a cubit, right? That's how deep the water is. And then he's going to measure another thousand and he brought me through in the waters to the loins. So how deep would that be? Would you just add another cubit? Did someone say something? Yeah, well, maybe about 35, 36, maybe. Okay, so, right. so you're going to say 35, 36. So you're taking the 21 inches to the knee, right? And now you're going to go up another how many inches? 15. Another 15 inches. Okay, so is everybody measuring their, their legs? Okay. Um, so 36 inches. Okay, so three feet. And that makes sense, right? Have you tried to triangulate this? What do you mean triangulate? From a Just thousand? Just calculate the, the ratios and the lengths of the triangle, I guess. Well, it wouldn't be much of an angle if you got a thousand cubits by uh, one cubit or by two cubits. No, 2,000 feet by one cubit. No, I haven't tried to figure it out, but it'd be a very small angle. Um, so Stephen, you had this ax of the apostles reference. That's just to where she talks about the water in Ezekiel yes. 47. Okay. Um, so that was Acts of the Apostles um, 14, paragraph one, for anybody who needs that reference. Okay, and then he, so he measures to the loin. So this is now 3,000 cubits. So how many inches is that? Sixty-three thousand. Yeah, so we have sixty-three thousand. So we had twenty-one thousand, and then we, and then when we got to it being in the knee, that was forty-two thousand inches. And how many feet is this now? That would be five thousand two hundred and fifty. Okay. So at this point, it's five two five zero feet, right? And it's. 63,000 inches. Okay, makes sense. And then, and afterward, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass over for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. Now, so this is 4,000. So you would add another, uh, you know, another 17, so it'd be 7,000 feet that we have, that he, when he gets to that point, it's, it's waters to swim in. So that's how far they end up measuring it. Now, uh, so a river that cannot be passed over. So what's the significance of this? We have four measurements of 1,000 feet or of a thousand cubits, which is 1,750 feet each, um, at the point where it's 5,250 feet, uh, the water is to his loin, so the water is about three feet deep, and then another thousand cubits, another 1,750 feet, the water he is now can't be crossed. It's just water to swim in. He couldn't walk on it. So that means it would be over his head. So what does this mean? 4,000 cubits, 7,000 feet.
What's being measured again? Have we decided on that? We know water is being measured. And what has Ellen White said about it? It's a wonderful, wonderful work. Okay, it's a wonderful work. Okay. So it's a sharing of a message. Okay, and, and we could relate it to a wonderful manifestation of the power of God as well. So why these, why these four measurements and why these heights? So all of these would be numerical representations of the message that we're to give. Okay, right. So, so, and so what are they representing specifically? So we have, of course, um, the 5250. So we can recognize that. 7,000 feet, what would this represent? Well, that represents the 70. Right, and it also just represents the number seven, which is the right. message of consecration. Okay. And then we have also these inches. So we had, we said six inches, 21 inches, and 36 inches. Right. Now, it is possible even it could have been seven inches, 21 inches and 36 inches. That's also possible. It could be instead of six inches, we could say seven inches. Um, what, what would these represent if we did it that way? Seven, 21, 36. I see the relationship between the seven and the 21, but I'm not catching the one on the, on the 36, but if it was 35, we would have one, three, five. Okay. So you're saying, so just adding it together, you mean? No. What are you doing one, three, five? I'm not sure what you mean. Okay. Seven. Oh, I see what you're saying. Three Peace. and then five. Right. So so a ratio of one, three, five. Correct. Okay. Um, you know, and that's possible that it's representing that. Um, now seven and twenty-one, I can understand quite well. And 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 thirty-five being half of seventy, that would make sense. And especially since it's seven thousand feet. Right at the at the well at the end of it you know so that's obviously going to be a higher measure um now if you took uh 72135 uh, could you say at the end of it that it's uh 70 inches no 63 would be the additive okay so you would go 72136 no what? 7, 21, plus 7, plus 21, plus 35 would give you 63. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. So you're saying that when you get to the end of the river, it's going to be 63 inches high. Right. Which would mean just that you couldn't put your feet on the ground because you have to keep your head above water. Right. So it's waters to swim in. That would make sense. Um. But all of these numbers you can see, we can relate them to these prophetic numbers that we have, if we take them as inches. Okay. Um, so, so these relate to the message. And this is a, a wonderful work, Ellen White says. That's what these waters represent, a wonderful work. So we know that they're, they're not talking about literal waters. Now, Waters can represent peoples. Do these waters here represent peoples? Well, it's possible. Um, the one, the clarifier that we have here is that 
only the prince comes in through the east gate. So how could peoples come in through the east gate if only the prince can come in? Yeah, so there's lots of reasons why we wouldn't take them as waters. But sometimes people, they see waters and they want to say they're peoples. But the only way that we could represent it is that it's a wonderful work and the people that benefit are, are people are the one that benefit from this. So in that sense, there's waters, but uh, the waters don't represent people, they would represent a message. Now, do we have an example of waters not representing people? In the Bible. Because what does water also represent? Well, it can be a destructive force in the, in, the, in the time of the flood. Right, so it can be a destructive force. And of course, it destroys people as well. But it's also a healing force, right? Could it be the Holy Spirit as well? Yeah, so re the Holy Spirit's represented by water. And, and that can be in the water of baptism, of cleansing, um, because it has to do with cleansing. And, and if you have water that you have to swim in, you're immersed in that water, you're baptized in that and, water. And in John 4, living water. Yeah, and then Jesus offers us water. Now, he offers, who's he offer water to in that, in John chapter 4? A poor lost soul from, <laughs> okay. from, well, from the Samaritan village. Yeah, so this is a Samaritan woman, right? And um, now she's by a well. And whose well is it? Jacob's. Jacob. Jacob's well. Why Jacob's well? Common ancestor, um, something that was, uh, was known to all the right. people. Okay. And who's Jacob? Think of the context of what we've studied in Ezekiel so far. Who is Jacob? Israel. He's Israel, right? Now, this is in Samaria, but we have Jacob's well. So Jacob dug wells, and, and he has a well outside of the city of Samaria, right? And this woman comes there to draw water. So who is this woman? A church. She's a church, right? And what kind of church? She's in an illegal uh, relationship. Right. So she's in an illegal relationship. And how many times has she been married? Five. five. Okay. So she's had five husbands. Anybody know what these five husbands represent? Could this be the five that have fallen? And one is. Okay, and I never one thought isn't. of it that way. Um, think of an think of a parable of Christ, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. How, how many brothers did he want five. to tell? Five. Five. Why yeah, five? Five brothers. Anybody know why there's five? Five kingdoms. Okay. How many sects were there in Judaism? Anybody know? In I have no this? idea. Five. There's five. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Zealots, and the Essenes. Right? Now, the Essenes are actually an offshoot of the uh, Sadducees. So they were a, a priestly class or at least, uh, and they believed that the Sadducees were an apostasy because the Sadducees were secularists to the sons of Zadok who controlled the temple. But these are the five sects. And so when Lazarus dies in this parable, um, or the rich man dies, pardon me, and, and Lazarus dies, but the rich man is the one who says, I want to tell my five brothers, right? And Jesus says, what to him? Anybody remember the parable of the rich man? Believe. Yeah, they wouldn't believe even if one rose from the dead. Right. So 
If they yeah. don't believe Moses, they're not going to believe you or me. Yeah. Okay, good. And if they don't believe Moses, yeah. So, so we know that even if one rose from the dead, they're still not going to believe. So this is a parable, not talking about what happens when you die. It's a parable uh, of a story that was often told to children, twisted around um, to make an illustration, and the Jews perceived that the parable was against them. Now, here we have this woman going to Jacob's well. And Jacob, of course, is Israel, and this woman has had five husbands. So what's her situation now? She's living with one that is not her husband. Okay. And why is she doing that? Why isn't she living with one of her husbands? Because her husbands would have divorced her. Right. So, so she's been divorced. So she's been cast out. She's been abandoned. And, and so she's just living with some guy. Because you have to, as a woman, you can't live on your own. So she's just living with some guy. And... Um, so why is she going to Jacob's well? What does Jacob's well have? It has the water that she needs. Okay, and what is that water? Words of life. Okay, but specifically, because we're studying Ezekiel chapter 47, and and we can go back and we can look at this as a measurement that this water represents prophecy, right? It represents the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit gives us prophecy. And we can see that to go to Jacob's well specifically, it reaches back to the time of Jacob. And, and in the story of Jacob, what do we have? We have time prophecies. We have the 430 years. We have the two periods of seven years. We also have the other two periods of seven years. So we have all these things. And we have this woman who has now been cast out from all the different groups. She's a woman of Samaria. So she comes and Samaria represents what? In, in the context of what we've studied, what would Samaria represent? Apostate. Apostate Protestantism, right? This is connected to the joining of the two sticks. So we can, can connect this message um, of Ezekiel that goes back to Ezekiel 37, the joining of the two sticks, to this story here in, in uh, John chapter 4. So whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again, talking about this earthly water. But whoso drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Um, so, you know, the, the rest of the parable goes on what we talked about. And, and then it says in verse 21, because this woman tries to distract him uh, when he asks a question, uh, or when, you know, he says that she has five husbands. So she tries to ask a question to distract him. She says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Um, why is she asking this question? Anybody know what's behind this question? She wants to get the attention off of herself and onto something else. Okay. And what's the something else that she wants to talk about? True worship. Okay. And why is she asking this specific question about this mountain and the mountain in Jerusalem? Well, she wants to know which one's the right mountain. Who's okay. got the right worship? So, so you have Mount Gerizim, right, in Samaria. And then you have Mount Zion in Jerusalem, if we want to put it that way. So, but why is she asking this question? So we know that she's trying to distract him because she doesn't really want to deal with this problem. And, and, it, and the problem here is that she's had five husbands. And if these husbands represent churches or sex of Christianity, she's now asking this question. So it is related to what, what these husbands represent, whether she realizes it or not, because um, she doesn't know that she's a church, but she's a church 
and she's gone all these different directions. She's cast out. Um, so she says, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, Mount Gerizim, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So what is she specifically asking? You know, on a, on a bit deeper level. Because, yeah, she wants to know what's true worship. But where does this question come from? Well, if you must always... sense... Okay, Stephen first. Yeah, I think she must sense that uh, her worship, the worship of the, of the Samaritans, there's something not right, right, right with it. She's feeling very much, uh, she's not satisfied. Okay. Uh, Dwight, was you going to make a comment as well? I was going to say my understanding was that it's coming out of fear. Okay, coming out of fear. Okay. So, so we know one of the things about the Samaritans is that they were people who uh, replaced those that were taken away under uh, uh, Sargon II. There's his name. Um, when, when, when Samaria was destroyed, right? And they were replaced under Esser Hayden, right? So people were removed the Samaritans or the Jews, northern Israel, was removed and scattered. And then Esar Hayden, according to Ezra chapter 2, I think, um, the Samaritans there, they recognized it was Esar Hayden who had brought them from all these different places to live in Samaria. So in northern Israel, is occupied by non-Jews. So she's a person, person that's not a Jew. But when people came to Samaria... Why did they try to worship the God of Israel? Why wouldn't they have continued worshiping the gods where they came from? There was oh, a, like lions came in and sort of had issues with lions. Okay. The, 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 the lions, the beasts of the land, sort of, um, there's somewhere in scripture that talks about that there. Uh, they couldn't, so they, I think they brought then Jews, some Jews back then at their time as well after that. Well, there would have been some Jews already there. So not everybody completely disappears from the land. Basically, you leave the poor people, you know, the, the outcasts. They actually don't usually go into captivity. You're going to bring the people who actually own stuff and are occupying the land, the farmers and so forth. So you have some people left. So there is some Jews left. Um, so when we look at these Samaritans, they, the main reason that they're worshiping the God of Israel is that in the Middle East, you worship the gods of the land. Wherever you go, those gods are the ones that need to be worshiped if you want to be prosperous. So you would think if you go someplace, you need to worship whatever gods are being worshiped there. You wouldn't bring your own gods with you. And, and, and this, this is demonstrated throughout the, the worship, that when you occupy a territory, you adapt and uh, you adopt and adapt the, the local gods. You don't just wipe them out. The Jews, of course, would um, wipe them out. Uh, but other people would always take, uh, uh, um, you know, it's like when the Philistines stole the ark, right? Um, they thought that they were gaining power. They didn't destroy it. They thought they were gaining power. So, um, but of course, then when things, they started getting sick and, and all that stuff, then they brought the ark back because on a cart, because the ark was obviously causing all these problems. They were not doing something right. So to try to bring this back to what we're doing in Ezekiel here, um, we can see that, that this story of these waters, they go back to Jacob and that the truth that's going to unlock or going to answer the questions that everyone has are going to be these time prophecies that go back to Jacob. Now, of course, it's not just about time prophecies. It's about a message, but it's a message that's founded upon the past. And 
you know, so people will read these words of Jesus here. Woman, believe me, for the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship what ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now, it's kind of sad that these words of Jesus, over time, have changed their meanings. That is, philosophy, Christian philosophy, has, has modified the significance of these words. Because truth now becomes this philosophical term. Spirit becomes something that's immaterial. Um, so when it says God is the spirit, what does that mean? What, what, what kind of language is this that Jesus is using when he says God is the spirit? What's the word spirit? What's that? He's using figurative language. Figurative language, right? So he's not talking literally. He's not saying God is a ghost, right? Which is how it would now be understood. And the word spirit is breath or wind. In, in uh, Greek, it's pneuma. In Hebrew, it's ruach, right? And, and we know that Jesus uses this also in John in other places. Um, so when he's talking about the spirit, what is he talking about? And he says, God is a spirit or God is spirit. Isn't it that God is also a message? Okay, well... <laughs> In a, in a sense, though that's not what I'm trying to get at here. Because when he says that God's a spirit, when, when Jews talking about spiritual, when they're saying something is spiritual, um, you know, because we throw this word around, it doesn't really have much meaning nowadays. But God works, God works how? Okay, when we think of the word spiritual and literal, what does spiritual and literal mean? How do we contrast those two terms? Well, when we worship in spirit, we're, we it's our mind. We worship with our mind. So in spirit, in truth is more than just literal. Okay, well, and, and that's, that's true. I mean, obviously spiritual things are are intellectual not just feelings right that because spirit kind of means more if ephemeral or something like that you know something that's not real um in in, in the common way that people look at the word spirit but when we say god is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit in truth when we think about spiritual, uh, what's, what's the most spiritual thing in the Bible? It's, it's kind of a bad question. But I've always looked at John 1 as being one of the uh, most okay. spiritual. Yeah, so, so if you look at John chapter 1, this is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, see, I would have said, and I agree with you, but I would have said Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Of course, these are the same things. For the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. If you compare these two chapters, Genesis chapter one and John chapter one, they're both going to talk about the beginning, and they're both going to talk about light. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So the most spiritual thing in the Bible is the creation of man. And, and then the recreation of man in Christ, in taking upon humanity. Does that make sense? 
I don't know if people understand where I'm going with this, but the basic thing that we have, what's that? It makes sense sense to me. I've, I've noted for many years that Genesis 1 and John 1 are so similar. Yeah. And, and so when we go with this water and we say that it's a message, right? So this water comes and it's a message and it has these measurements. And, and you know, we can talk about it's, it's a wonderful work because Ellen White says that. So we know that it's about a work. And it's also for the healing. And this healing, of course, is spiritual healing. Um, because she's not talking about people going to get some water and to bathe in it and be healed, right? She's talking about something, what we would call spiritual. So we're understanding this spiritually. And, and we know that which is first is literal. And then that which is afterward is spiritual. That is, literal things typify spiritual things. Correct? That's how we understand the spiritual and literal. So the question is, which is more real, the literal or the spiritual? Any comments on that? Well, it's the spiritual, but we're still stuck in this present evil world. So we have to deal with the literal, the material. Right. But the literal is temporary, right? The spiritual is eternal. Correct? Yes. Well, when, you, when you have a experience with the Lord, it is real for each person. Yeah, but you know, I understand what you're saying, but I'm trying to even make a point that's a bit deeper than that. Because, uh, you know, part of the, the postmodern thinking is that there is no such thing as reality. And that all exists is what is in our minds. And that things are only true because you believe them to be true. And what's true to you isn't true to me. So when it comes to reality, what is reality? What is real? Based on the scriptures. Because, because we in this message, we have used things uh, where we talk about something is typical and something is anti-typical. What is, what is a type? Is the type the reality or is the anti-type the reality? The anti-type. Okay, the anti-type. Why do you say that? Because you could argue that the type is just the real thing and it's pointing to this to the anti-type, which isn't the real thing. That is, it's just this spiritual thing. It's not real. So why well, would you argue that the yeah. anti-type is real? You normally apply a type to be in like a shadow. Right. So once you're in that shadow, that's a shadow of something which is real. Right. You know, like... So 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 when we deal with these waters. Right, so these waters, uh, let's just go on and read this in Ezekiel 47. Um, so he had measured the last time, this is a river that could not be passed over, it's waters to swim in, right? And he said unto me, son of man, hast thou seen this? And then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. So remember, the, he's being guided to look at these things. So he's, he's examining these things and all these things that he's shown He's being shown that he can show them to us, right? Because Ezekiel is, is going to give this message. Now, when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side or the other, on, and on the other, right? So we're going to see that this scene here, and this is what we're going to study tomorrow. Uh, we're going to see that this scene here ties with Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 11. So we're going to kind of bring these together. We sort of laid a foundation to do this, to understand what this is talking about. Um, and then I'm just going to read a bit further, and we'll study these in detail uh, tomorrow. Then said he unto me, these waters issue out toward the east country, 
and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that every living, everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live where, whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from En Gedi, even unto Engelim, En Enegleim. And egling, that's a hard word to say. And they shall be, and they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. And by the bank upon and by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees. For meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. So that's where we're going to end today. We'll come back and look at these verses. So I want you to think about them. And, and also looking at Daniel, because in order to understand Daniel 12, fully and revelation 11 fully you need to be able to see what ezekiel is talking about and how this is connected so uh let's close with a word of prayer <clears throat> dear father in heaven we are thankful for your spirit uh, that speaks to our hearts and we're thankful that this world is temporary and not real and that the things that people are so concerned about in this world, um, the temporal things, we know, Lord, are not sure, but your word is sure. And um, we know that we are in the midst of these prophecies being fulfilled. And all around us is um, some of the strangest things we've ever seen. But we know, Lord, they've been prophesied about in your word. And we ask that we can trust in you as we go through this history. Uh, be with each person today. Watch over them and help us and guide our minds. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.